a starting position that food and wine is a product of a place. And that place is defined by the ecology and the physical environment. And then that influences the things that come from it. And so we kind of look at food and wine through this, this ecological lens. And uh, being of Italian uh, background, this particular topic has been something of an obsession for mine for, for many decades. And I'm really, really pleased to be able to, to come out and share uh, some of these um, lessons that I've learned and some new lessons being exposed to this wine. Um, I just uh, want to say thanks again to the Victoria Wine Festival, Dave, wherever you've gone. Um, this has been a, a rather Herculean task to, uh, to pull this off. Thank you very much for coming out and uh, recognize once more uh, World Wine Synergy with uh, Grace and, and Richard Will. We'll talk more about, about them. These are the wines in their portfolio and they're very special wines for a, a number of reasons. So before we get, I know everybody wants to get get going and and uh, and grab glasses. I just want to kind of set the set the table for you, I guess, uh, a little bit, and give you a little insight of why I think Italian wine, Italian grapes, are are so uh, profound. The Vitis vinifera, the wine grape, the the European wine grape, is one species. So all the wines that we know of almost 99.9 percent .9 of the wines that you're familiar with are all of one species. But this species manifests in, in thousands of different ways. Nothing, and take it from an ecologist, there is no other species on this planet that is more influenced, more impacted by the micro environment that it exists in than this species. Slightly more heat, slightly less heat, a little bit more water, slightly shortly, a shorter season, a longer season, a little bit more clay in the soil, a little less clay in the soil, a little this, a little of that, manifests tremendous differences. You put on top of that, our species are the world champions at manipulating the environment so as to create these microenvironments. You put those two things together and you get this incredibly diverse world of wine. It probably does not reach its apex until you get to Italy. And you look at this map outline of Italy, and this is the geopolitical place that we know is, as Italy. It's a, it's a homogenous place in the sense of, of its borders, but within those borders, there's a tremendous amount of variation. So we have a north-south orientation. So up in the north, colder climates, shorter growing seasons, in the south, cripplingly hot. Very long seasons, completely different environments. We have a central mountainous spine that runs down the country. Very different conditions on the east very than on the west. Very, con very different conditions at the bottom of the mountains and then as we go up in ever higher ev ele <laughs> elevations, then conditions change too. All the while, the vines are responding to these differences and creating different grapes that produce different wines. We then layer that on top of a tremendously active geological history that has created a huge number of different kinds of soils, right? Obviously very important to influencing how the wines develop. The heat, if you're a winemaker, the growing degree day, so-called, is probably the very first thing that you're starting to look at in differentiating how your wines are going to be. And so, just want to emphasize the dramatic differences across this north-south gradient. We'll come back to this a number of times through the, through the talk. And then finally, that's all the biological and the geological side of things. And then there's the human side. This is a picture of all of the language families in Italy. So the major colors, the blues and the oranges and the purples and so forth, those are the sort of the, the general um, languages or dialects. And then each one inside is the specific dialects. And so these are boundaries. And so these people that are manipulating the ground to achieve these wines have a very small world because just over there, there's another group and they don't really speak the same language. We don't really talk to them. And, and so these vines are being cultured and nurtured in a very insular environment across, if we step back, across a very diverse environment. And so if we put all that together, we have this geological complexity that then drives the biological complexity. Things that operate and, and thrive in the north will not thrive in the south. Things that work well in the east will not work in the west and so on. We then take that biological diversity 
And then put on top of that, the fact that the people that exist in these places are responding to their environmental realities. And so they're operating in different ways. Which then lend, lends us, or leads us to a place of tremendous diversity. So it's a, it's a biological, geological, cultural bouillabaisse of, of, of possibilities. So there's, this is currently, oh, there we go. This is currently the, the Bible of, of Italian grape varieties. It lists in detail 500 different varieties. That's a quarter of the total number of documented varieties in Italy. There's 350 or so wine varietals that are commercially produced and, and traceable, but 2,000 when we consider our, all the artisanal production. So we're gonna get to a sliver of that. I, I like to think this is, a, this is a pretty good sliver. If you're gonna pick a sliver, this is the one you probably wanna, you wanna pick. But it is a tremendous diversity out there for these reasons that I've, that I've talked to. So our first stop on, on this little trip is Prosecco. And so if you find your first glass, you can have a look at it. You'll, you know, I'm, I'm sure Prosecco needs very little introduction to, uh, to the room. The grape is Glera. So up until 2009, Prosecco the place and Prosecco the drink were the same thing, and you can imagine the kind of confusion that might cost, cause. And so they changed the name of the grape to Glera. So this is a Prosecco made from the Glera grape. Prosecco's home is the, the spiritual home, if you will, is Valdobbiadene, which is kind of right up the top corner there in the Veneto. Where we're actually going is just over the border into Friuli. Still within the Prosecco DOC, the, the documented area of Prosecco, but a little bit outside of the norm. To make Prosecco, you'd use something called, well, the, the Italian method, the Charmat method, the Tank method, Martinotti. Martinotti. So Martinotti was the, the, the person who, the Italian, who invented this idea of how to get bubbles into this wine, which I'll get to in a minute. Take a sniff. Feel free to dig in. Don't, don't be shy. Saturday night. But he didn't have a way to make it operationally from a, a, a commercial point of view. That's where the engineer Charmat came in and actually invented the pressurized tanks, a modern version that you see there. And so Charmat provided the actual technology to make the Martinotti method financially or commercially viable. It's now carries the name mostly Charmat. The emergence of sparkling wine has really caught a lot of people, Prosecco particularly, but there's a lot of sparkling wine out there. What makes Prosecco different from all the other things out there? Well, you can break sparkling wine down into three general categories. One is the method in which it's made. The so-called traditional method or method champagnois, the, the champagne method. The, the uh, transfer method, we're not gonna get into these, and then the ones that we've already talked about, the Charmat, etc. All of these methods depend on a secondary fermentation to capture the bubbles. That's where the bubbles are in the wine. So you make a still wine, you make a, a regular wine, a table wine, and then you add a little bit of sugar, maybe a little bit of yeast and some other things, and then put it into a pressurized bottle. It could be in the bottle itself, it could be in a pressurized tank, as in the method we've been talking about, to capture the, the CO2, the carbon dioxide that's gonna be produced in that secondary fermentation. This is done in uh, the Prosecco, in the Charm method, in a large tank. How much pressure do you allow to build up? The champagnes, cremats, cavas are at the peak. Champagne probably at the, at the top can reach um, even eight or, or nine uh, atmospheres. An atmosphere is roughly 15 PSI. So this is, these, these bottles are, are, there's more pressure in there than the tires of your car. Right? These are literally bombs you know, in your hand. And if you, if you make your way to, to, to Cava particularly, where they make vast amounts um, and bottles do go off, more bottles explode 
in one major cava producer per year in, uh, in, in um, Pinades than is produced in all the New World. Right? That's, <laughs> and so when you, when you tour these places, many of the cellar hands are, you know, they might have four or three fingers because they do go off. Anyway, let's not get sidetracked. Um, high pressure. What, we're, what we've got, normally Prosecco can come in two, two pressure um, flavors. We have Spumante, a little bit higher pressure, and then Frizzante, as the name suggests, a little bit low. So Spumante sounds energetic. Frizzante is a little, a little less uh, aggressive on the tongue. For be sparkling wine in the EU, you have to have at least three um, atmospheres of pressure. And then sweetness. How much sweetness is in the wine? You can go from very, very little to absolutely no to extraordinarily sweet. Champagne, up until, you know, in the life of the champagne, recent history was a sweet drink. It's only very recently that it, um, the style came dominated by, by, um, by dry. So, for us right now, we've got the Charmat method, we've got a Prosecco Spumante, and it is a, what we might call off-dry. Now, the, 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 the sweetness categories are, are sometimes, I think, intentionally confusing to throw you off. Um, this is extra dry, meaning it's kind of sweet. <laughs> compared to other, it's, no, it's not sweet at all compared to a truly sweet wine, but there is a little bit of residual sugar in there that will allow you to extract a little bit more flavor. So finally, we get to the wine itself. It's uh, Zago is the producer. It is a silt over clay, which is going to make a very full wine, a voluptuous wine. And this is uh, what makes, I'm gonna try and give you something like unique about all of these. There's many things unique about all of these wines, but what I think you know, what you really want to sort of literally take home. Um, and this is a millisimato, which means this is a vintage Prosecco. So this is made with wines all from the same year, much as like a vintage champagne might be. So you can look at it. So the, the normal course of events is eyes, nose, palate. And we can look at that and say, oh, you know, there's um, a good amount of color in there. Not all Proseccos are, are going to pack sort of a, a lot of, of color into, uh, uh, into their wines. And so as a result, we're expecting, you know, a fairly intense flavor. On the nose, I get sort of really um, like a golden, a golden apple. But on the on the, the, the palate, like all the, the 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 nose materials are there, but to me there's a, a really strong kind of honeydew, uh, the sweetness, and it's not sweet, not candy sweet, right? But the fullness of the um, of the aromas kind of really envelop your mouth, and there's kind of honey derivatives in that wine. The producer uh, Zago is very um, extraordinarily proud, actually, of uh, their organic standing, and the, and the little honeybee up there is the the Italian uh, symbol of you know we do good things, uh, meaning that you know they're not killing bees or or there's there's no very little chem well there's no chemical inputs, and so on. Um, doing um, doing this wine in this part of the world where there is a heck of a lot of what can we call it? Uh, industrial grade Prosecco, let's say, um, where the, the, the objective is profit, and there's nothing wrong with profit, but oftentimes that will come at the cost of other things like the broader environment in which the, the grape is grown. And so to find a Prosecco that delivers this much punch while still preserving and in fact enhancing uh, the physical environment is, uh, frankly, it's not an easy find, and not an easy find at this price point. The, the I've, I've said a lot about the sweetness, but this is not so sweet that you wouldn't put it with shellfish, right? Prosecco, as a rule, 
many Proseccos, I, I'd be a little hesitant to, to marry the sweetness of the Prosecco with the brine of, a, of an oyster and say, I think, I think this would be perfectly at home with that kind of a, of a pairing. Um, yeah. Okay. We like the Prosecco? Any, feel free, you can shout out questions. I'm just going to keep marching along, but, but I don't want to... Um, you don't want to stifle conversation. Oftentimes a question will stimulate something else in the back of my mind that might be interesting. I'm a total wine movie, but uh, yep. why is it called Brut Fen if it's extra um, The, is it Brut? It says on the label here. Is it Brut? That's me. Oh. That's me. That's a, let's. No, we're going to. There. <laughs> so, like I said, it's brute. <laughs> I swear, I swear, I saw, I saw 16 grams per liter somewhere in my reason. I've been, I've, so, backstory, I've been, spent the whole week doing a deep dive on these ones, because I'm such a geek, but, and, and I, there's a lot of volume of material that came up, and somewhere along the lines, I missed, okay, Brute, see, you're not, a, you, you just called me out. <laughs> Put me down, so you're, you earned your stripes already. Pardon me? It does taste good, speak to me. It, well, so, there, we're all on the same, we're all on the same, the same, the same page. There is a, despite, so, Brute can, you know, only the French could come up with this system where it's brut nature zero to three, right? But you can be extra brut, which somehow is sweeter than, than, or than, than brut nature, but it's zero to six. So you could call a wine that is three, either of those two, or brut, which is up to 12. So I'm gonna use that as my defense for being confused. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody with an easy question? <laughs> yes? Because you can, sorry, get in the mic. There are cremants out there that will fit both. The, the vast majority will be in the higher, the higher, pressure, the higher pressure level. Not, I won't say there aren't any that doesn't exist. I've never seen one. It's the, it's, it's, it's one of these, well, if you, uh, there's, a, there's a certain expectation in the French wine world that you're, you're coming in with way more knowledge than, than most of us have. Yes, ma'am. Excellent question. So, the, uh, how how does the flavor change pre versus post fermentation? To make a sparkling wine, you need grapes that are really high in acid, like super high. So, if you uh, the 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 <laughs> champagne is a wonderful example. And I'm just going to pick on champagne because they can take it. Champagne is a wonderful example of um, making uh, lemonade out of lemons, almost literally where a still wine that is produced in the very north end, northern France, very cold, very difficult to get the grapes ripe conventionally. So tons of acid, not much sugar. Still wines, not the most pleasant. But if you add, ironically, if you add carbon dioxide, more, it's more acidic than the wine itself, the effect is very pleasing. And so the wines, to, to make any sparkling wine, whether uh, Chenin Blanc, uh, if you're in the Loire Valley, you can make Cremants from that, uh, Prosecco and Glera, um, Chardonnay, if it doesn't get much sun, all make wonderful sparkling wines because, well, not because they're not very good still, but, but what makes them not particularly attractive as still wines make them excellent sparkling wines. So Glera is used for sparkling wines for that purpose. It's an exceedingly high acid grape. See, these are great questions. Yeah. Um, sometimes they have like really tiny bubbles and sometimes there's bigger bubbles. 
Yeah. What's the word to look for on a label if you like a particular style? Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, there, there's, there's very rarely a indication the style of the wine will tell you. And so each, and, and so what we're actually talking about is pressure. So the greater the pressure, the finer the bubbles. Typically, the longer it's been sitting on lees, so on the dead, the dead cells of the yeast, will create the conditions necessary to super saturate the, uh, the liquid. And when, that, when you pop the cork, that, all that gas comes out, of, um, comes out of suspension, and that super saturation is what gives you the super fine bubbles. And so champagnes that have been sitting now for five or seven years or more have that almost you know, sort of ethereal foam, it's not even bubbles anymore, um, but it's the pressure. So if you're, if you're after finer bubbles and we're seeing in the Cremant world, then you, you're probably looking for uh, spumante, not frizzante. That's the easiest, easiest way to go. You bet. Okay, let's, let's move on. So now we're going from the, the north all the way down to the south and offshore onto the island of Sardinia or Sardinia. And um, this is uh, an area, this, the, this island has been the home or the, the place where were literally millennia of conflicts and takeovers have occurred. And so, so what the, the, the soils of, of Sardinia have seen a lot and the influences of the many cultures that have taken over that, that island that remain today in the wines. The Phoenicians, the seagoing traders that, that, that opened up the Mediterranean were the first to bring the vines to, to Sardinia. But it was the Spanish who occupied the island from the 14th to the 18th century that really brought winemaking to, um, to the, the, the modern technology, if you will, of the 14th century was brought to bear to, to Sardinia. And that is what remains uh, to this day. It's hard to talk about Sardinia without talking about Vermentino, the classic white grape of Sardinia. Now, there's, you, if you go and get a bunch of, of you know, wine researchers together, the first thing that usually pops up is talking about the history and the origin stories of various grapes. And Vermentino is one that is guaranteed to start a fight because nobody really knows where it came from. We're starting to get a fairly good idea that the evidence is, is, is kind of pushing in one direction, but there's various camps. And it's made more complex by the grape known as pigato in Liguria. So pigato means spots, which is, makes it obvious. And the favrita in Piemonte, in Barolo and Barbaresco country, this is all Vermentino. They go by different names, but think back to that graph I had of all the different dialects. These people don't talk to each other, right? And so they give different names to the same grapes. And that's what makes unraveling the history of these things particularly complicated. So um, Vermentino is an incredibly vigorous vine. It will, if you let it, produce vast amounts of grapes, which from one hand, might, you might think is a good thing, right? I'm, I'm a farmer, I like to make lots of product. However, the problem with that is that the plant has a set amount of material it can push into the grapes that are gonna produce the flavor. If you let it grow with reckless abandon, you're essentially diluting that finite amount of material into a huge number of grapes. So the challenge of Vermentino is to rein in that vigor. What better way to rein it in then plant it in among the world's least fertile soils. Right? And that's what we have in northern Sardinia. Not a great place if you want to graze cattle. Super place if you want to rein in a hyper vigorous vine like Sardinia, or like Sardinia, like Vermentino. And so um, as a result, this legendary heat of the island, the very infertile soils and everything, force the plant to think, oh, crap, you know, I'm, I'm on the edge of death here. I need to make babies. And it's getting pretty, pretty brutal out there. I need to make my babies the highest quality they can be 
we're, I'm talking about grapes, right? Just keep, keep up with me. So if you're a grapevine, my babies are the grapes, right? So I need to make the highest quality babies I can. So I'm pushing all the material I can. I'm not growing anymore. I'm not producing leaves and stems and everything like I would normally. I'm putting them into these, into these berries. And so the job of the vineyard manager, the viticulturist, is to walk that thin line with the plants to keep them think, thinking that things are going to get dire. Don't grow vegetatively, grow the fruit, grow the reproductive organs, but not keep them on such a place where they're actually doing without. So you want them to be able to, to produce the best fruit possible, but keep that dire view in mind. This has reached its peak in Sardinia. Vermentino is the grape that is best or is iconic of that wild, hostile environment. And so these vines are 30 years old. The, um, the, the, um, the plague that was um, phylloxera, you may have heard of a, of a root louse that basically wiped out the, the vines of, of most of Europe through the mid-1800s. Um, it, it was devastating. It, we don't go into the story, it came from here. Um, not here, here, but came from North America. If you have sandy soils, tremendously infertile soils, the louse couldn't take hold. And so not only in, in, in Sardinia do we have this tremendous Vermentino, these particular vines are on their original rootstock. So these, these vines were never hit with phylloxera or their the, their, their ancestors, and so these are ancestral vines right from, um, right from long ago and not put on North American rootstock that is, is resistant to phylloxera. So, the, on the nose, I think you can't help but get a saline kind of blush with this wine. The, the, the dry heat produces an herb-like quality in the, in the nose. That will dissipate, for me anyway. It dissipates on the palate. And by the way, I, sh I should say at this point, I run a lot of wine classes at UVic, and I, I, one of the things I do is bring in undergrads um, and try and expose them to, to wine carefully. <laughs> um, and you know, one of the first things we do is a human sensory lab where we exam we don't examine each other's physiology, that's not what I mean to say. Um, but we expose the differences in human, human to human variation. And that because I get, for example, saline off of this, that might not be what you get. The, the differences in the, the human physiology, I'm sure you're not surprised to hear, can be dramatic from person to person. And so how a wine manifests for you might not be the same for the person next to you. So please don't take my, you know, I'm saying it's, it's X or Y and, and you know, that's it, it's, it's written in stone, far from it. That said, they're saline in here, come on. <laughs> Should we do retronasal <laughs> tasting? Has anybody heard of retronasal? Does anybody want to know about retronasal tasting? You can taste with your taste buds five, well, six, if you can cut new mommy things. Right? The taste that we think about when we say taste and flavor, it's actually in your nose. And so if you take a sip and swallow it, you're using your tongue. Right? It's, 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 it's like, you know, trying to put a screw in with a hammer. It's just not, it's just not gonna work. You actually have to volatilize the material and push it up through the back of your nose and expose your, the, 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 the actual smell or the aroma organs to that. You'll get a lot more out of it. You can put people, as has been done, you can put people in MRIs and have them do normal tasting and retronasal. And when they do retronasal, their brain just lights up because it actually stimulates all of those. 
26% of your brain is dedicated to taste. Right? And if you just taste normally, you're using a tiny fraction of a percent of that. And so if you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's fine. I'm used to it. <laughs> just remember, retronasal breathing. Google it. Figure it out. It'll, it'll increase your wine level of wine enjoyment immensely. Anyway, let's keep, <clears throat> let's keep moving with this. Um, what else can I tell you? Yeah, so, so the, the saline, saline and this thing mineral, right? What is it with this minerality in wine? It's not like the wines are actually like eating the rocks, right? There is a relationship between salinity. You can imagine how wine can, can manifest salinity. Right? It only takes a, a chlorine atom to do that. There's a very tight relationship. If you get saline on the nose, you're probably going to get minerality on the palate. And I think this wine is a, is a prime example of that. And so they, what makes this wine particularly special is coming from a very hostile, hot place, and somehow it's retained acidity, great amounts. It's, very, it's alive, it jumps, it's, it's, it's a verb in your mouth but it also speaks to all of those things that make Sardinia such an amazing place. A lot of those Mediterranean herbs and, and so on. Okay. Pliny the Elder. We're going back in time, <laughs> way back. So Pliny the Elder um, had this great observation, in wine there is truth. I have found that you actually have to drink a glass of wine to see truth in that statement. <laughs> but it's there if you, if you look hard enough. He also said this, Uva Pantastica is a particularly high quality grape in his magnus opus that was uh, written two years before he died. And so that set a lot of people off. Well, what is this grape that... Pliny, Pliny the Elder is, is, is a pretty big deal in terms of chronicling ancient Rome. Without his writings, we would know very, well, I won't say very little, but we would know uh, vastly less than we do. He was also the very first wine critic. He was very much into his wine. Had much to say about that. So park that in your mind, right? This, this Uva Pantastica. Cori is a town um, just south, about 50 kilometers or so south of, of, of Rome. And uh, it has a long history of being impover financially impoverished. And in the early to mid-1900s, when the rest of the country were ripping up um, grapevines to take advantage of Italy's growing place in the international wine market and planting things like uh, Trebbiano and Malvasia to very hyper-productive wines. I mean, much like Vermentino in a sense, you can put a plant in and it will produce tremendous amounts of grapes. Unfortunately, the wines made from those grapes are really thin, very neutral, and utterly forgettable. <laughs> but you've got wine, in a sense. In Cori and other places in Italy, that were deeply impoverished, there wasn't even the financial capital to rip up the vines. The place was, it wasn't completely abandoned, but it was overlooked. It was overlooked until in 1967, this fellow, uh, Dino Santorelli. Yeah, Dino Santorelli, I'm gonna make sure I've got my story right. Um, he founds a, um, a vineyard, Castelle del Giglio, and he saw in this place opportunity. So, so as I've talked about, wines are all about expressing place, and sometimes that place can be a relatively small area. He was a wine merchant in Rome, so he knew in broad strokes what he was looking for, and saw this place in, in um, an opportunity. Started the, the winery. A number of years later, his son joins in cooperation with the government and plants um, 60 different varietals in that vineyard in an attempt to figure out what is going to work here best. The real plan was to give a home 
to indigenous varieties that had been lost, or, well, not completely lost, but had been lost to commercial production. One of those was the grape Bellone. This is Uva Fantastica. Straight shot from ancient Rome right to your glass. Thanks to the foresight of this and other, there are a few other producers, not many. So let's dig in. Right, hold on. So this is wine three. Now clay and alluvial soils. Clay to a winemaker is that's 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 a song. That's a you like clay because it's going to hold water. If you are in a dry environment, which you know this certainly is, and you've got some clay in your soil, that means that your vines are going to be able to weather periods of what otherwise might be drought. <clears throat> These vines are 70 years old. These are old vines, and it's late harvest. And so what that means is that the, the grapes hang on the vines for as long as possible. So remember back me saying that, that the, the, the grapes, the vines are pushing materials into the grapes. Pushing sugar into the grapes is easy. The leaves are out there, photosynthesis, you get sugar. That's easy. What is difficult are the thousands of flavor uh, compounds that give the intense, well, give the, first of all, the, the characteristic flavor, and then the more of them you have, the more intense the flavor. These molecules are very expensive for the plant to make, and so it takes a long time, much more expensive to make than sugar. So the longer you let them hang, then the longer you're giving the plant to make it. You're also, though, potentially making sugar. And so when you see late harvest, particularly, particularly like in, a, in a, like a German wine context, like late harvest is code for sweet wine. I mean, you try this wine. <clears throat> this is not a sweet wine. Mm. <laughs> it's a really good wine, <laughs> but it's not a sweet wine, right? And we know this by looking at the alcohol content. 14%, right? That's a pretty high alcohol content for a white wine. What that's saying is these grapes started off full of sugar, but all of that sugar has been digested by yeast and turned into alcohol. So if this wine came in at, at say, 12%, which is more typical of a, of a white wine, there'd be a lot of residual sugar, right? It would be, in my estimation, it would be a flabby, kind of soft wine, right? This is alive, it, it dances. This particular wine is also, there's this producer, they, they make two bolognas. One is um, a more straightforward expression of the wine. This is the, this wine that you have is the one that's gotten a little bit more TLC. It's gotten the superior part of the vineyard. It's gotten a little bit more attention in the winery. And as a result, what you get is a real flesh, again, what I get, perhaps what you get, is a real flesh of tropical fruit. Mangoes, papaya, etc. What you don't get normally when you get, when we start getting into the tropical fruit world in wine, we're also getting a lot of syrupy elements in the wine. This is the best of both worlds. We're getting tremendous fruit. I mean, there's a, there's a lot going on in this wine, I think. But we're not getting the candy that often one must deal with in other type wines. And so, was Pliny, was Pliny onto something with this? I think he was. There is only 511 hectares of this wine in all of Italy, of this grape, which means in the world then, because it's only grown in Italy. All right, so 511 hectares, it's all that's left. Yeah? How many, uh, How many well, huh. 
Well, you've opened up a can of worms there. Um, because, as I already said, you have, you, you have a grapevine, and depending on how you manipulate the vine, it can produce a tremendous amount of grapes, or it can produce very little. The thinking being that if you drop, what they, what they say, drop fruit, so you're, you're cutting bunches off before they become ripe, now the plant is left to put all of its resources into the balance of, of things that, of, um, of wines that are, or of, what am I trying to say, of uh, bunches, grapes that are, that are left. So I'm a little leery to say it, it, you get X from that. Um, roughly five, hmm, a baseline is five tons a hectare, but we can, we can vary dramatically from that. So then it comes, okay, so five tons. How much are you going to press it? The finest wines get a, oh, like that, and that's it, we're done, right? Just the, so it's like, think of it like um, extra virgin olive oil, right? So the, the olives come in, they get the gentle, no heat, no, nothing like that, just the gentlest to press, that's extra virgin, right? And then we push it a little harder, that's virgin. Push it a little harder, put some enzymes in there, break it down a little bit more, and it gets lighter and lighter and lighter, and so you're, you're, you're getting all different grades out of it. It's not quite the same with wine, but you get where I'm going, that it's, it's, it, it, it depends, you decide how much juice you're going to get out of a ton of grapes. Is this, hard to find in BC? Is this, is this wine hard to find in BC? Not if you know the right people. <laughs> so, no, I'm... I'm Joking, of course. Um, no, no, it's not. Um, but it, um, the, one of the reasons that we're doing, or one of the reasons I'm so glad to work with, with Grace and Richard and Christy and everybody at, at Worldwide Synergy is because they are working to bring these, without, without them, these wines would never make it to us. Because we live in a socialist society, it's really the only way to put it. We, have, we live in a government monopoly, right, that if you can't, if you can't give us, you know, X number of hundreds of cases, then it's not really profitable for us to work in. So everything's on special order. And it's a very hard system to work in, but we, there are some people um, that are working uh, within the system and some, you know, um, to bring small producer wines to us, and these are all, and I'll tell you a little bit more about, about all these wines in a minute, but these are all small producers, all quality-minded producers, um, and it is, it, it is more difficult than it should be given the constraints of the system that we operate in, but it is not at all impossible, yes. And we'll talk at the end of our, where, how you go about chasing down these wines. Okay. Jesus, keep moving. All right. Um, right, so Caesar, a little bit into the future, a little bit past uh, Pliny's time, not too far. Caesar's, Caesar was uh, a mastermind in all kinds of ways. One of the, 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 the most profound things he did was when um, a, a, a Roman soldier retired, he was given a plot of land which he could call his own, on the proviso that he planted grapes. Caesar knew that if a soldier planted vines, he would defend that land. And if he defended that land, he's defending it for the Roman Empire. And that's how the Roman Empire kept marching and never lost ground in reverse. Because as, cause you, would, you would leave and you, know, you would be gone oftentimes for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Oftentimes, you would just retire, and you'd look around and, and say, well, that's it, I'm done, right? Retire, here's your land, here's your vines, done. And then the army keeps marching forward. This wine is a product of that policy. This is um, a, um, a wine that starts, is native in Lazio, so the province of Rome. This is, that's its home. But it's found its modern home and its greatest expression in Emilia Romagna, particularly um, in and around the Rubicon. So again, a river that has 
some pretty uh, fundamental associations with Caesar. As the soldiers retired, this is where um, they set up house, and it is um, this particular grape called Albana, and specifically Albana Bianco. There are some other morphs out there. This is a, a truly um, amazing wine. Its name comes from Cali Albani, the, the, the hills surrounding Rome, so giving a hint of where it comes from. But this wine that we're about to taste comes from Emilia Romagna. And what makes this wine particularly interesting and unique is this geological feature uh, called Spangione Romanolo. And what it is is, is seashells. So this was at one time a marine um, basin. And this cal the calcareous seashells have been essentially um, locked in or fused in a calcareous sand mix. Now, does, is anybody familiar with another famous wine region that, is, that produces a lightning sharp uh, evocative white wine due primarily to the shells? Chablis. Chablis. I wish I had a prize. <laughs> I, I, you're, you're, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Chablis. And so along the Chablis line of things, so to hear that this combination makes for a particularly um, racy um, acid that isn't overpowering, but supports, it's a framework that supports a tremendous amount of uh, fruit. So let's, let's dig into, into this. Mm. Now, this wine is another late harvest, so late that there's a touch, a slight touch of botrytis or noble rot. Those who are familiar with Sauternes, the dessert wines, those are truly sweet wines. This has a smidge, just a tiny bit, just to add depth of flavor. And so on, to me, so one, you usually try and look at the wine over a white surface just so you're not fooling yourself. The, the, the looks of this wine suggests, oh, a moderate wine, nothing, nothing particularly um, compelling until you put it to your nose and like, oh, wait a minute, there's a whole lot going on in here. Part of that is the Albana grape. Part of that is the, the, the ridiculous, precise nature of the producer to make this wine. And some of it is that very late harvest, allowing the vines to push maximum amount of all those good molecules into the grapes and a little bit of that Betrayta Sinera to add a depth. But not so much that you would smell that or taste it and go, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a botrycized wine. That's, that's not the story here. Hmm. I get it. The, like the, the notes say, a kind of a toasted almond on the, on the nose or even um, like a, an almond skin, you know, the, the, the amaro, the, the bitter in a good way, right? That kind of comes through. Yeah. Um, do you have a DOCG up there? And it's on the bottom over here. It says DOC. It might be a little bit of Well, geez, you guys are sharp. <laughs> it's DOCG. Oh, did I not? And it's DOCG. So I'm seeing DOCG and DOCG up in the corner. Is that? Oh, on there. Ah, well, that's not me. <laughs> we'll talk to the person responsible. Anyway, um, all wines that we've had tonight and all wines we will have tonight are um, fermented on indigenous yeasts, and so no lab yeasts. These are, and, and, and you know, that might sound 
uh, quaint, it makes a huge amount of difference because just as the grapes are a product of that place, so are the yeasts. And the yeasts, of course, are doing all the heavy lifting. They're doing the dramatic biochemistry that's turning this from grape juice into wine. And so the yeast have a, a, a particularly profound effect on it. And unlike lab yeasts, which come with very defined, predictable characteristics, right? wild indigenous yeast are wild and they're unpredictable. So it calls for a much higher level of understanding of the place and the wines. This is not something that somebody is going to walk into a place anew and be able to pull off. You're, you're actually tasting um, a craft that has been honed three times and, and in almost all cases, many generations. And so it's, it's, ah, it's beautiful. Um, 15,000 bottles total, that's all that's made. So again, you know, without forward thinking um, agencies like the one we're partnered with here tonight, we would never see, we would never see this wine. Hmm, okay. Yep. So the, what's the difference between DOCG, sorry, DOC and DOCG? Um, I want to say G. <laughs> so um, with, I'll, I'll, I, I will give an admittedly very um, um, overly simplistic answer just in, in the interest of time. The Italian, well, the, the EU and specifically the Italian government has a body that oversees uh, what is allowed to be, pro that, that dictates how a wine is produced in a particular area, what grapes are, are produced, uh, the maximum um, grapes per hectare, uh, the minimum bricks or, or the minimum amount of sugar, which is a proxy for ripeness. It goes on and on and on and on and on. The whole idea is that if you meet all of these things, you are creating a wine that is an accurate and authentic representation of this wine and its historical um, predecessors. Those areas that are recognized, so that's DOC. And then, so there's DOC, and then there's two levels below. So there's a table wine and, and IGT, which is um, a, a uh, indication, you know, the, the, an indication of geographic typicity, but doesn't meet the quality levels of a DOC. And then there's DOCG, which is um, the difference, the G is guaranteed. So this is a superior wine, and we guarantee it. And so it, and all these wines go through human taste panels, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the DOCG is from particular appellations that are deemed to be of the highest quality. Good question. Sorry, I got old ears. Yeah. 2,000 vines per hectare. Sorry, it, it, so sometimes these talks are for people that actually care about that stuff. <laughs> um, I, I get that it, it's all great, it's what's in the glass that matters. Um, but up until recently, and I mean really recently, there's been the, the, the assumption, and it makes a certain amount of sense, that if I plant more vines per hectare, then I'm you know, spreading the resources of the soil out over more plants, I'm doing myself a disservice, right? So maybe less vines per hectare, and uh, my vines will be healthier. Turns out, not so much. Yeah, the vines actually, we don't have to get into it, but the vines actually deal among themselves. They sense the density and operate accordingly. Yeah, there's, there's some really cool science going on with that. Okay. Move on to reds. When I say Sangiovese, you say Chianti, Tuscany, right? That's the natural, the natural association. Turns out, not so much. That Sangiovese, its home is Emilia Romagna. So much so that the, some really high wattage producers in Tuscany, in, in County Classico and, and a couple of other places, have taken 
to separate themselves from Emilia Romagna seeing what's coming down the, the pike and using the more accurate name for their wines, Sangiovetto. And so the Sangiovese that we always associate with Tuscan wines is actually more correctly a Sangiovetto. The true Sangiovese, its home is in Emilia Romagna. Now, if you see, here's the vineyard. This is a picture of the vineyard we're going, and then a, a, further, um, a further shot of the vineyard where we're heading. And you'll see the morning fog. Does that remind anybody of any particular uh, noteworthy Italian wine producing region? Would it help if I said the Italian word for fog is nebbia? Oh. Barolos, Nebbiolo, right? The wine of, of, of Piemonte. We're not going there. But this is reminiscent. What makes the, the, the Lange region, the tongue, so that the hills of, of, um, of the area look like tongues, in the valleys of the tongue collect fog every morning. That fog dissipates the heat. The, the, the main thrust of the heat doesn't really get going until noon or one or two o'clock. What that does is really tamp the heat down, and so the grapes have a much longer growing season. All the other areas around those that do not benefit from that morning fog, their grapes grow ra really rapidly. They get to sugar ripeness before they get to what's called phenolic ripeness. In other words, they get so much sugar in them that they have to be picked, but they haven't had the chance to pump all those expensive flavor compounds in there. And so they're a much blander, weaker wine. What makes Barolo, and to some extent, Barbaresco in the main areas so powerful is the Nebbia. This wine comes from a place in Emilia Romagna that similarly benefits from this um, particular phenomena. And it is made by the up and coming name in Northern Italian wine, Chiara Condello. With, at the wise age of 30, she is uh, setting the Italian a northern Italian, anyway, at wine world um, on fire. You've got a 2016 in front of you. This is her second vintage after taking over the, the family um, vineyard. And she also runs her own, uh, her own label, too. And so um, is, is attracting, uh, well-deserved, uh, attracting a tremendous amount of, um, of attention. So the Sangiovese that we're talking about, what makes it separate from the... Um, the, the Sangiovetto or the, the Sangiovese Grosso, the one that is in, in Tuscany, is that the Emilia Romagna berries are very small compared to Grosso, right, large, and the name says it all. If you've got small berries, you've got a lot more skin per unit of pulp, right? The, the skin, the surface volume ratio begins favoring the skin. All the flavor is in the skins. So when you cut a wine, a wine grape, or well, any grape really, in half, you see white, fleshy pulp. Doesn't matter if it's a black grape or a white grape or gray or whatever. The pulp is always the same. The flavor is all in the skins. And so the more time the juice spends in contact with the skins, the more flavor it extracts. The more skins there are to extract from, the more stuff is going to come out. And so if you've got really small berries, that's what every winemaker loves. The Emilia Romagna version of Sangiovese differentiates itself by small bunches and small berries. This particular winemaker sets herself apart by being organic plus, so organic times, times 10. Their spontaneous fermentation, which is all of these wines, no temperature controls, right? The, 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 the thinking here is I don't want to get in the way of the wine expressing itself. Now, that said, when fermentation really kicks off, it generates a lot of heat. That can be a problem. So how that's handled, no chilling, no modern technologies, simply racking the wine, just simply moving it from one vessel to the other. It's kind of like pouring a hot water from one cup into another if you're trying to drop the temperature, same idea. That's how 
that's handled. No pumps to oxygenate. So pumps, first of all, are sometimes difficult to operate, but they also risk oxygenating the wine, which is absolutely what you don't want to do. There's no processing. There's no additives. There's no nothing in this wine. It's not filtered. It is the purest expression of the land that you can possibly be. This is essentially a Burgundian approach to a Emilia-Romagna Sangiovese. You will also find that this Sangiovese, where am I, is a far more nuanced wine. If you're, if you're familiar with Sangiovese and, and sort of the, 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 the typical um, big, muscular, um, meaty, brawny Sangiovese, that, you know, that could be your jam, that's great. This isn't it. This is a reflection of a younger winemaker with an updated vision of Sangiovese and also taking advantage of these very um, flavor intense bunches that she has to work with. And so we've got stainless steel involved here. Don't want to interfere. Don't want to have oak intervene into the expression of the wine. And so it's fermented in, um, in stainless steel and then aged in um, more stainless steel. And if there's any wood involved, it's extraordinarily old. In other words, it's neutral in terms of the impact it has on the wine. And you can kind of look at that glass through the light Right? It's clearly dark, but it's not inky black like you might find some uh, more conventional Sangiovese. It's still got, for me, Sangiovese's, you know, cherries, cherries and clean dirt. Right? That's, the, that's, that's the tell. Um, that's still there, but there are floral notes. There's, there's, there's a lot of things going on in here that are not your normal Sangiovese. Oh, I forgot the... Hmm. We like? <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, that's, that's awesome. It's, it's nuanced, it's light, but it's not fuzzy. It's not like, you could sit and just have this, you know, that doesn't call for necessarily a super special occasion. <laughs> like right now, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I, I like the, the, the there's, a, there's, there's almost a changing of the guard in, 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 um, in Italy that uh, particularly, and, and with a certain amount of fractious going on up in Barolo, as the old guard, the old you know, heavy, you know, it has to be in the cellar for 20 years um, before it's drinkable, blah, blah, blah. And then you know, the young uh, minds coming up and say, are you crazy? Right? Who, who puts wine down for 20 years? We need to make the change. The, the, this wine is not that. It's, it's not that dramatic a, a change, but it is definitely uh, an update on the conventional Sangiovese. And it's very exciting, and, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, Chiara gets uh, uh, all the credit that she's been uh, lavished, had lavished upon her, is well deserved. Okay. I think I hit all my notes. Very good. Moving on. Back to Rome. Back to Lazio. And ancient Rome, again. So now we get a shout out from none other than the emperor. Uh, and this emperor, Nerva, was so taken by this particular grape that he built a palace dedicated to it in Pilio which happens to be in Pilio, is the, sort of the, the, the ground zero of where this, this grape um, originated from. This is a 3D um, mock-up of what it probably looked like. Uh, if you go um, there now, it's considerably less impressive, although 
you can sit and, and just sort of think about you know, what once was uh, in this place, a giant palace dedicated to a particular grapevine. At this point, we're going back to Casale uh, del Giglio. So recall, uh, this is the farm that you know, carried out the big experiment and what, you know, what, can, we, what can we grow here and what's gonna work and um, turns out a number of interesting things work, but also recall that really the, the underlying motivator was to, to uh, breathe new life into, in, in, into grape varietals that, that might have uh, gone by the way and, and were at risk of, of being lost. Um, Cesanese is the grape. It too is naturally very late ripening. And so it takes a long time to get this wine to do its thing. These traits, it, it's good from a consumer's point of view. I like late harvest wines because the vines have had a chance to put all that good stuff in there. If you are a farmer, though, that means your grapes are hanging out there longer. And that means it could be a hailstorm that destroys your whole crop. It could be a flood. It could be um, pests and disease and, and uh, fungus is always a constant uh, worry. So the longer your grapes hang out there, the more risk you take. At that time when Italy pivoted from these are our grapes, these are the grapes of our people to let's sell wine to the world and as much as possible and make as much money as we can and everybody ripped out those wines. Cesanese was one of the first to go because if your whole mode of operation is maximizing profit, then let's reduce the risk. Cesanese, out it goes. Turns out, that in this experiment at Caselli de Giglio, Cesnesi was one of the varieties that really rose to the top in terms of performance in, in this particular landscape. Also a big surprise was the fact that the farm was sitting on top of a Vosky tribe um, town site. So Voskis were the, well, I guess the Etruscans, right, that predated the Romans. And so we're going back to the, between the 6th and 4th century BC. And so now a big part of them, not a, a significant part of the vineyard is now an anthropological site that has been turned over to, uh, to that side of the, um, of, the, of the academic world. And um, it is turning out to be incredibly rich in terms of the, um, uh, the insight that it's providing. And so we have, this, we have this farm that is not only a living laboratory providing new life for almost lost biodiversity of, of, uh, that goes back to the, the Italian antiquity, but also the material uh, evidence of that long life too. So it's, a, it's, you know, it's quite a special place, all because of a Roman wine merchant had, was savvy enough to look around and go, you know, I think this place has, has potential. And now, now look at it. So, Cesanese. The, the red wine of Lazio, um, not terribly um, uh, popular yet in this market, though this wine is listed, you will find it at the BCL stores. Um, it is a wine that is produced on lighter volcanic soils and so again it's this idea of we're going to make the vines really work and push all of those goodies into the babies because this is a harsh environment to, um, to work in. The, I won't go through um, the entire list here but Obviously, this dedication to ancestral varieties also comes with a pretty strong sort of ethical position to let the land speak through the wine rather than let the winemaker speak through the wine. And so as a result, every vintage is different. So again, minimum intervention, let the land speak. You've got the 2017, this is a fruit forward uh, expression of Cesanese. The 2018 is going to be released in, um, in a few weeks. It's a very different wine. It's not hugely different. It's still Cesanese and it's got all the, the, core, the core structure is there. 
but it is a demonstrably different wine. You could easily pick the two apart in a, in a blind tasting, I imagine. Right? And so that's one of the beauties of all of these wines is that you're not producing a brand. Right? A brand is by definition something that's invariant. Right? I go to it now, I go to it next year, I go to it in 10 years, it's always the same. Good wines change with the time. Anybody can make a good wine in a good year. Well, anybody. <laughs> you know, I probably couldn't, but you know, somebody who knew what they were doing can probably make a good wine in a good year. What separates the really knowledgeable people and those who really know their land, know their vines, know their place, are those who can make good wine in off years. And neither of these are particularly off, but they are very different. And such, the wines are very different. Or they are different. I don't want to be too, too dramatic. <laughs> the classic combination with this wine is buffalo. And you might say, okay, <laughs> where's the buffalo coming from? So it's not the buffalo that we're used to thinking about. Mozzarella, mozzarella de buffalo, is the real mozzarella by law. So back to DOC. DOC mozzarella, so it's not just wine, it's all foods. DOC mozzarella must be made with water buffalo milk. That's the buffalo. And not surprisingly, there's a good number of buffalo running around in Italy. And so um, you can uh, make a wonderful stew with the buffalo. This is uh, according, to, um, according to the people at, uh, at the winery. That's where this wine shows up. I have yet to have that particular experience. But I look forward to it. One way we can get around that is um, kind of trading on the uh, beef bourguignon idea and go for a manso de Lazio, right? Which is beef of Lazio, maybe some BC beef, right? <laughs> and some Lazio wine. So that's how I think this, this is a big one. There's, some, there's some, some pretty grippy tannins in there that need to push off against something, right? This is not, uh, it's a great wine, but it needs, it, all of these wines are food. All old, uh, be careful. Most old world wines are food wines, right? They need, in fact, we're, we're, we're made to go with the food of the place. This is a, a sterling example of that. Okay. That's why you can't touch it down here and challenge it. Yeah, right. Are we good? Cruising to the finish line? Okay, now we're heading off down to Sardinia again, that harsh, hot landscape. This time, our target, though, is a red, the other grape of Sardinia, Carignano. Carignano, Carignano goes by a number of different names, most of them of Spanish origin, which gives you a hint of its origin actual origin. So back to the Mediterranean political fluxes and the fact that Spain occupied that island between the 14th and 18th centuries. So Carignina right, is, the, is the wine of, of the same grape in central Spain, Mazzulo in, in Rioja, um, uh, Samso in Catalan. Right? These are all the same grapes, but many would argue, I certainly would argue, but I'm, uh, Sardinian Carignano is, is my particular um, favorite. Was not always the way though. Carignan is another one of these really vigorous grapes, can produce a tremendous amount of grapes if you let it. That led to the so-called wine lake of Europe that forced the EU to come in and play the policeman and begin ratcheting back Italian massive production of low, yeah, sure, we can call it low quality wine, right? Basically carrying nothing more than just the, um, than just the sheer literal volume of wine. 
Karen Yan played a big role in that because it is pre predisposed to producing vast amounts of grapes if you let it and thus flooding the market with, with cheap, cheap products. And so those are, those are the, the um, fermentation and storage vats going in to, um, to one of these operations. So to give you an idea of the scale that we're, that we're talking about here. Not something that you're gonna probably wanna seek out. So back to Sardinia, up in the north in the green is the Vermentino area, down in the south is the home of the, um, the Carignan. Remember what Sardinia is all about, harsh landscape, perfect place to really force what would be an otherwise really vigorous vine into controlling itself, for lack of a better term, right? And put the resources into the grapes, not into the leaves. And this is what the vineyards in many of those places look like in the peak area, right? Caniano del Sulcius, Sulcius, Sulcis, there we go, Sulcis. It's sand. I mean, it's literally sand, right? This is a hostile place for a wine grape to grow. This is telling the grape, you better smarten up and make some babies because this isn't gonna last, right? And as a result, this is where Carignan finds, for my money, the best expression. Yeah. Is that what all of Sardinia is like? Or no, no, that? no, no. This is. So, so that's what a lot of Sulcis is. That's and this I chose this picture because it's pretty dramatic, right? But sand, sand is a major is a major component of all of those vineyards, and sand is what kept this place free of phylloxera. So these vines are also on their native rootstock. These are, these are unaltered vines. The vast majority of, of grape vines out there have been grafted, so they've been, they've, their roots have been cut off, and they've been grafted to American, North American rootstock to prevent infection by, um, by phylloxera. And just as you can pick your clones for the grapes, you can pick your clones for the roots. If I have really wet soil, then I'm going to pick my rootstock to meet that wet soil. If I've got you know, too much clay or not enough um, iron or whatever the case may be, you, there's a stud book essentially for rootstock, just as there's a stud book for uh, vine clones. And you can mix and match. None of that happens here. These are all what are called mesal selection or, or natural selection by the farmers generation after generation. But the point being, it's sand, right? This is going to force the grapes to really work hard to provision those offspring. What else is going on all through Sardinia is um, the remnants of a former civilization that um, remains very physically present in this, in this landscape. So the Naranga people... Uh, occupied this area from about 18, 1800 BC to about 7,000, right? And so we're going deep history. There remains 7,000, or sorry, no, from 1800 BC, they occupied the area until the Romans conquested, so moving forward in time, until the Romans showed up and took care of them. There is 7,000 remaining artifacts of their uh, existence across Sardinia, right? And Sardinia is like 260-some kilometers north to south. Not a big, it's much smaller than, than Vancouver Island, right? And there's 7,000 such um, things um, to this day. These are obviously the site of many um, anthropological uh, investigations, and the wine that we're going to um, enjoy is a tribute um, to that, and you'll notice the label uh, has been inspired by, um, by some of these, these artifacts. And um, Nur is the abbreviation of the Nur Nuragic civilization that is iconic of Sardinia. The wine itself is also iconic of Sardinia. Very old vines again. So Carignan 
for me, carry-on sits in this sweet spot between um, big and bold and you know, very, you know, very mellow, like a, like a Pinot Noir or something that is you know, all about nuance. Carrion is, is that, that sweet spot in the middle. What makes this particular wine so, I think, special and evocative is that because of the conditions that it was grown in, the challenges that it had to face, it has produced a wine that, as far as I know, cannot, no other wine in the Carignan library can be called creamy. This is a creamy Carignan. It's still tannic, there's still bite there, it's still, it's still a red wine. But damn, it's smooth. And like any, and I, and I failed to mention this up until now, I should have mentioned it earlier. My tell for a, a high quality wine, a good quality wine, is the length of the finish. So you swallow, does it keep giving you, does it keep evolving, does it keep changing? All these wines do in their own way. This one, as I'm talking, I'm, I'm like, wow, it's, it's still going, that's still, still changing, right? This wine really speaks to you. And it speaks to you in a language unlike any other Carignan that's out there. And I'm, I'm, I'm a big Carignan fan. Um, yeah. Here it is. 14 percent, you know, not for, not for the weak at heart. So again, dry, big, ripe, sun-drenched grapes. All of it turned into alcohol, though, right? Very low residual sugar. Stainless steel dominates the processing. Again, not wanting to get in the way of, of you know, this is a, is, is, it's a Carignan, it's a big red, but it's still subtle and nuanced in its own way. You don't want to mess that up with oak. We like? Small grapes because all the tannins are in the skins. Can't say because we're being taped and this will live forever, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to be very careful. I, I'm not going to say, you know, from what I know, the size difference will be minimal. I would say these are probably going to be larger, yes, but not so large. They're going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, they're going to be smaller than the Sangiovese Grosso. The San you saw the picture, the Sangiovese Grosso has got their name for a reason, right? And so these would be somewhere in, in, in between. That said, year-to-year -year changes will, or the, the vintage, the, 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 the weather during the year will have as much to do with imparting those characteristics than than anything else. And so it's not just the size, but it plays a big role. <laughs> Anything else before we move on to our last, our last wine? So we'll finish the evening up in uh, Trentino Alto Adige, so back up to the north of the country um, in the shadows of the Dogtooth Dolomite Mountains. Um, the, the, the wines of this region, in my estimation, don't get enough exposure. We're, we, we don't see a lot of them. It's a tremendously interesting region that produces a wide array of, of wines. Um, we all know Syrah, yes, Shiraz. money have I got on me? I've got 20 bucks. 20 bucks. Who can tell me the parents of Syrah? <laughs> what are the parent varieties? Yeah, I had to look it up too. <laughs> it's these two. 
right? So here are two, two wines, two, two wine varietals, unheard of, largely, right? That make a gangbuster of progeny. Why do we care? Because the sister to one of those pairs is the wine that we're interested in today. Who has been mated with an unknown, probably lost, extinct varietal to give rise to Langren, which is the Lagerin, which is the wine of Tyrol, right? a very iconic wine, all of which is the progeny of Pinot. And so, and so Pinot means the progenitor, or the, the, I should say the ancestor, of Pinot Noir and Pinot Blanc and Pinot Meunier, if you're a Champagne fan, Pinot Gris, Pinot, 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 Pinot. And so this wine that we're about to have is uh, a part of a very um, august family, shall we say. Uh, I'm an academic. I'm always ready if somebody says, prove it. Um, <laughs> here's the reference. Right? And um, here is the grape, right? And so, um, now, my, the way I learned um, Italian is the emphasis in, in my sort of, um, um, you know, hillbilly is the only word for my family in, in Puglia. <laughs> um, the emphasis is always on the second last syllable. But I want, where is Richard? You always knock this off. Grace, what's the name of that wine? Terro Delgo. Terro, see, I would pronounce that Terro, terro Dego, with the emphasis on this. So this is why I'm always, I'm kind of looking at, okay, set my mind up, don't screw it up, say it right. The emphasis is on the first E, if you want to get this right. This is all evidence of the fact that we do not see a lot of this wine here, right, that I'm still struggling to, to get over saying it in the dialect that is, that is appropriate. Where it comes from is not um, obviously in the Trentino, but in this particular valley, so the Adige River and the Noche River form a bit of a crotch. Right in that valley is the epicenter. This is a microhabitat that this grape will express itself there like nowhere else in the world. And this particular uh, little, little, um, little area is in which where our, our vineyard um, is, is found. The uh, Ulzbach family, um, not a conventional Italian name. It also, though, reflects the deep history of this place because at one time, this was on the boundary of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Right? And so this family, though very Italian, right, traces its history back, although it's been on this land or in this area since the 1600s. Right? And so I like that story because it just reminds us that, that this place, it was only unified in the mid-1800s. Italy only became Italy in the 1800s, and before that, it's been this constant boiling sort of sea of change, um, cultural, physical, etc. And finally, um, well, we, we hadn't actually gotten to this, um, this wine, but it, it's, um, the area is full, of, um, full of, of vineyards and one that actually we talked about earlier today, but we didn't get to it today, so I'll just move on. Like all the wines, this is a small producer that um, is talking, taking small volumes and putting a lot of, of TLC into, uh, into, each of, uh, each, into each of the vines not the kind of thing that you're going to be able to do if your only reason doing it is to, to generate um, a profit. So this is not uh, an industrial profit engine, it's about expressing the land to the best, uh, best case possible. That doesn't mean that there can't be innovations. So non-vitricized or, or non-glass lined clay fermenters for example, have been found to allow this particular wine to really uh, express itself 
to the maximum possible. And so there we go. Again, indigenous, indigenous yeast, quite small production. Right? Again, we would not have access to this if it weren't for some dogged people going out there and getting it for us. So the Dolomite hills, the Dolomite mountains, right, provide the necessary requirements for this like truly inky black wine. That's why we're finishing with this wine. It's the biggest, it's the, it's the boldest. For me, I get lots of red fruits on the nose, but on the palate, man, that current just, boom. I get lots and lots of currents. And, and then after that, we often talk about wines, but red wines being you know, dominated by red fruits or black fruits. You see, this actually is one of the few wines that's dominated by blue fruits, right? Something intermediate. And it's a lovely wine. Again, the, the finish just continues on and on again due in large part to the very, I won't get into the, the details, but looking at the fermentation regime where we're using whole berries, only destemming some labor intensive to find the sweet spot to allow the wine to express that landscape to the greatest extent possible. Another, another winner. So with the, 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 the power of this wine, you're going to want to find something to play off against it. Right? This will play very nicely with some fat. Right? So um, cured meats, bacon, giancale, uh, which is the pig jowl, um, which is, I can't for the life of me understand why we don't see more giancale around. Um, it is uh, built for uh, this this particular wine and, and, and wines like it. A carbonara, right, with a little bit of, of, of fat, or uh, stews and braised chicken, something for it to push against. And it will really, if you like it now, you'll love it with uh, something to, uh, to bring out the, uh, uh, the deeper aspects of it. Okay, well. We're done, finally. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I want to, to say uh, one more um, thank you to, to all the folks that put this together. I also want to give a shout out to um, Worldwide Synergy, who again, if without their efforts, uh, and, 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 and they really are true efforts, there is a great amount of scrutiny that goes into these producers. Um, if, they, if they don't sell locally, Right? If, if, if these producers cannot sell wine to their community, Grace and the team will not pick them up. They will not represent them. Right? If they're not family owned, they're not being represented. If they're not in tune with their environment, they're not being represented. And so it's been a real treat to work with, um, with this group. Um, the portfolio is, is available online. The wines um, are, are there for you. Take. Um, the the uh, cards home, uh, Grace and the team and and oh, Richard is somewhere. Christie's in the back. Um, they're here to answer questions. If you want to know how you can uh, access these wines, take a card, email them, talk to them now. Question in the back. Yeah. It, oak loses its, in, loses its contribution to the flavor. So the, the question is, 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 does oak always contribute to the wine? Uh, no. After about three or four iterations, oak becomes neutral. But it will allow ox micro-oxygenation. And so it does influence the wine, but not in a, not in a, in a material Yeah. Yep. Oftentimes you'd use the wood that's local, right? Which can be awesome and sometimes not so much. I just wanted to point out, um, these are phenomenal prices. Right? <laughs> what? Well. You're getting here for these prices. It's unbelievable. 
I, I, I think I'm safe in speaking for, for the crew that the, the whole idea is to get these wines into your hands and to provide a low, as low a bar as possible to do that. Because when you, when you buy these wines, you become a co-producer of these wines. You are not a con consumer involved in a transactional operation where you hand your money over, you take your wine, thank you very much, and it's done. You're actually contributing to the ongoing financial viability of these producers who otherwise would not have this voice to, to bring their wines to you. And so um, the team is all part of that ecosystem, I think. Yes, I'm going to say, I'm going to say yes. It is. It is. It's not. It is. It is. It's not uncommon for wines, white wines of particular regions, and particularly white wines of a particular quality level. What you will often find, um, and and by no means does a clear bottle mean it's lower quality. What you will find, though, is the predominance of lower quality wines in clear bottles. So. You know, be careful how you apply that, and it's not my fault if it goes wrong. <laughs> anything? Anything to add? You got a microphone in your hand. I think you're going to talk. <laughs> I put it in here. Okay. <laughs> well, first, uh, I'd like to thank everyone. I mean, this is a, a very strange time, and this year is particularly hard for the wine industry, for the hospitality industry. And I must thank the organizer, Dave, and he put it, it, this seminar together and enable us to carry on to uh, talk about our producers or many others that happen in this festival and giving us the opportunity to share with you this spectacular uh, work that they have done. And we also wanted to thank all of you for coming out. It means a lot to us. Thank you so much at uh, taking your time and also coming to support Victoria Wine Festival. And also I'd like to thank Dr. John Wolpe for your time. And it is not often that we be able to um, engage someone at his credential, his level, to come and to deliver um, such a wonderful um, seminar, very in-depth and very detailed and share with you uh, the dynamics, put it this way, not just about wine and not a little bit about food, but you learn tonight the cultural background, the history, all these touches, it's all happening in the glass. Wine is a living thing. The, product, the producer have done his job, really deliver excellent wine to you. And that journey has an end. That journey continues because they are now in this market and in your hand to continue the beauty of it, to enjoy it, to find the right food to pair with it. The wine, just drinking that alone, may give you only the two axes, you might think, the X and Y. But once you mix it with the food, it's beautiful. It gives you the dimension. It gives you something we call palate chemistry. And you just expose in your mouth, and you will find something else. And that's the whole idea. It was a very good question that in common, and thank you so much for noticing that. These are all produced are very, very small in Italian standard because there are millions of bottles. Some of them even like 14 million bottles that they are competing, selling each year. But these producers, they are small as like 22,000 bottles a year. A year. These are not for commercial purpose. We have a mission because I live in B 
BC for 42 years. And I consider myself very, very grateful to be in this country and this province, and in particular BC, because we have a lot of raw resources. We need more and more wine like this to help us to pair and bring the beauty of the food that we have. And so thankful that we have someone like Dave doing the cheese and the meat and introducing all the food vendors and all the little producer and the produce and whatnot. And it is so wonderful when I decided to bring in and expand the horizons of the varietals that offer in our community. And I see we only really buy a handful of them. We need to be a bit more open mind and try new things beyond Chardonnay, beyond Riesling. They are wonderful, but we, we learned it. We know them. But there are so many others, such as Teodogo, such as Albana. And I am so grateful, and our team, and I have Richard and Christy, and we travel. We go to little villages. We communicate our purpose. And these producers, they were not profit-minded because we put education for all fun. I said to the producer, I would want to bring your tradition and your culture to our market. Let us understand you. Let us understand your passion. Let us help you to carry on. And the producer would ask me, what do you think? The prices will work for our market, given we have a very expensive taxation. And they would be surprised seeing the price if I work out for them. This is what our consumer will have to pay for. If I am selling the value of your wine, and this would have to be three times as much. But that's not for general public. Every day I can put your wine on the table. So what can we do? They were working, and they were very, very generous in their offer. We don't have a lot of cases allocated to us for that purpose, because they still need to make a living. But luckily, a lot of these producers sell at least 80% of their wine in the local market. And to us, that fits into our criteria. We do not want to sell private label or label that made by Negozio. Not that they're not good, but that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to carry on their generation and bring that story to you. Whether you are in the industry, which people love story, and the connection is the most important that I find. And there are many touching stories of each of these family that I met personally. They love Canadians. Hopefully COVID quickly over someday. And I meant what I said is that if you decide to go to and visit any of this Producer, please write me an email. Allow us to set up a private tasting with the family and also have a tour of the cellar. And that's our gift to you. Thank you so much and stay safe. Hopefully this will be all over. I don't have to talk with my mask. <laughs> <laughs> and we see you more often. And we just so missed, missed so much, and I'm so touched that I'm be able to do this tonight. Thank you again, and thank you to the staff that helping tonight, and the volunteer, Kate and Dave. I mean, I couldn't thank you enough, Dave, because he's giving us exclusivity, and that means so much to us, that allowing us to show. And I know that he probably lost a few <laughs> supporters because of that. But this is the only way that would be able to communicate the, the whole dynamics to you. It is the indigenous grape of Italy and their family. And thank you, thank you, and thank you.
Thank you so much, Grace. So I'll just say the fun things, which is the first thing. Thank you so much to John. John did an amazing presentation. He may be hiding behind a pillar, but he's smiling. <laughs> Richard and Grace, big thank you to them as well to getting these wines in. So just the fun things is, uh, I should have said this at the beginning and I completely uh, missed it. In front of you, you have some whole food treats. And this is from Leslie Stowe. Um, I saw some of you see the pineapple pairing on one of the wines and open up your crisps. Fantastic move. Um, but those are for you to take home if you haven't already eaten them. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Please just leave in your bubble and just respect everybody's boundaries. Thanks again. <laughs>